of my mind and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you pleasing to you may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you my god Cause you're my rock and my redeemer you're the reason that i sing i desire to be a blessing in your eyes and every hour every moment lord i want to be your servant i desire to be a blessing in your eyes in your eyes may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart Pleasing to you, pleasing to you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, my God. Cause you're my rock and my redeemer. You're the reason that I sing. Desire to be a blessing in your eyes. And every hour, every moment, Lord, I want to be your servant. I desire to be a blessing in your eyes. In your eyes. May the words of my mouth. And the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, my God. Just wanted to welcome you to Forestdale Church. I'm the pastor here. And uh, just wanted to point out a couple things before we get uh, going with our worship service. First, we're gearing up for a new community group that's starting in the fall at our house here in the, the, the parsonage. It'll be the first Tuesday of September, so not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday we're going to start. But there's two other community groups that are already meeting, and one of them's on Wednesday night, and then the other one's on Thursday night. So you can look at our website for more, more information or see it on the slides um, as you come and go through the church. They're all a little bit different, uh, just kind of their aim, but really the general purpose that they all have is to build one another up in love. It's a more intentional time with a smaller group that you don't get um, at a corporate worship gathering like we have here. We found those very important for our spiritual growth, my wife and I, through the years, and we were really excited to hear that it's been a part of the history of Forestdale Church and something you guys have wanted to do. Um, the other thing I just wanted to point out is giving. Maybe this is a sin. I've never mentioned tithing in six months as a pastor. And I just wanted to point this out. We are a 501c3. That means we're dependent on donors uh, to do everything that we do as a church. Um, we try to make it easy to give. You can give with in the, in the, the um, tithing plates in the back. You can also give online. And um, one thing online you can do is also just set up recurring giving. I found that, for me personally, the easiest thing. Not only are we a nonprofit, but we're a church. And we see throughout Scripture... Uh, God's people uh, working together to provide for the needs of the assembly to worship together. And it's such a humbling thing to see how faithful and generous the members of Forestdale Church have been for over 170 years now. We don't take that for granted, but we ask that, that you give if, this, if you call this church uh, your home. If you don't and you give anyways, we're really, really thankful for that. Well, let's just take a, a few seconds now to quiet our hearts before the Lord and in silent prayer, and then we'll respond to his call to worship together.
Psalm 69, verses 30 through 34. I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox, more than a bull with its horns and hooves. The poor will see and be glad. You who seek God, may your hearts live. The Lord hears the needy and does not despise his captive people. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and all that move in them. As we uh, begin worship, uh, just join me in a time of corporate prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity to be in your presence. And we just want to declare at the outset of this service uh, that each one of us is here because we are gathered in the name of Jesus. And the banner of Jesus hangs over uh, this entire meeting, this entire assembling. And these are just, uh, these are just walls. This is just a roof. This is just a floor. Uh, but when we gather in the name of Jesus, we are the church. And uh, we just claim that, uh, that truth that uh, where we gather in the name of Jesus, you are there with us. So we just uh, surrender to the Holy Spirit ourselves in this time. And we ask that you would move among us as we seek your face, as we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I had the uh, privilege of uh, preaching last week, and I preached uh, a, a song about the sufficiency of Christ. And I, I actually quoted the song that we're going to do. And it's, it's a worship song that celebrates uh, the lavish provisions of who our God is. Um, and it's really this song in particular, to get to that point, to talk about how lavish our God is, and he is a lavish God. Uh, it, it, basically, this song is a journey through Scripture to get to that point. Um, it's going to take us to Philippians 4.12. Uh, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living or in plenty or in want, because Jireh means God is our provider. I've learned the secret of being content because I know who he is. Um, it's going to take us to Luke 15.17. When he came to himself, this is talking about the prodigal son, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? Uh, it's going to take us into the Sermon on the Mount. See how the lilies of the field grow. They don't spin or labor. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Your God is Jaira. He is the provider. And it's going to take us to the promise of Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that's work, at work within us. And all these scripture verses, they underscore the theme that comes from uh, Genesis 22, which is where this word actually was invented. This word was invented on a mountaintop called Mount Moriah in Israel, modern-day Israel. It's now the center of Jerusalem, but on top of Mount Moriah, that's where God met Abraham. He said, listen, the sacrifice of your son, Abraham, is not going to be enough, but I am the God who is enough. And I will provide. And, God, and that's where Abraham said, you are Jehovah Jireh. You are God, our provider. God said to Abraham, the sacrifice of your son is not going to be enough because it's going to be the sacrifice of my son. And that is the ultimate enough that this song actually celebrates. So if you know it, uh, you've heard it in the background uh, probably for a year now because I've been singing this song for about that long. But it's just a tremendous journey through Scripture. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. I wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am. Every 
circumstance Jaira you are enough I don't want to forget See so clear what it's all about. Stay by my side when the sun goes down. Don't want to forget how I feel right now. Chira, you are in love. Chira, you are in love. already love I'm already chosen I know who I am I know what you've spoken I'm already love more than I could imagine and that is enough I'm already love Already chose. Know who I am. I know what you spoke. I know what you spoke. Already love. Already love. What I could imagine. And that is enough. Already loved. I'm already loved. I'm already chosen.
more than you ask, think, or imagine. According to His power working in us, it's more than enough. More than you ask, think, or imagine. According to His power working in us, more than enough. Sing it, church. When you ask, think, or imagine, according to His power working in us, it's more than enough. More than you ask, think, or imagine, according to His power working in us, it's more than enough. I will be content in every circumstance. Jaira, you are in love. So I will be content in every circumstance. Jaira, you are in love.
shelter of your presence in the shadow of your wings i am safe i am safe i will hold on to your promise you will not abandon me i am safe i am safe Great to see you here uh, this evening. We're going to spend some time in prayer uh, together, and uh, as we do so, I uh, was handed this uh, notice of uh, prayer from um, Pastor Victor. I haven't even read it yet, so I'm going to read it to you as if for the first time, because it is the first time. Pastor Victor is our missionary down in uh, Belize. He's uh, uh, actually a national. He is, is from Belize. I'm not sure what you call a national from Belize. Belizean? Is that right? Okay. Yes. All right. Sounds, sounds good. Okay. Uh, but he's lived there his whole life, and his passion and his heart is really for his people and really uh, evangelism and discipleship, and that's what he's been doing down there. We actually sent a team down a, a few years ago to be part of a building down there. There's actually a room in this church called the Forestdale Church Room uh, that they named after uh, th this church for all the, the partnership we've had with them. Anyway, Pastor Victor writes, Please keep us in your prayers as we travel to Ohio and Pennsylvania and can conclude our trip by visiting our son-in-law and daughter and granddaughter in Louisiana. Uh, continue to pray for our ministry, that more souls will be one for the Lord. We just finished with our vacation Bible school where we had over 300 children in attendance every day. Uh, we also had one of our major events, Operation Back to School Blessing. Over 600 children received a backpack with school supplies. This was so necessary. So many people are without jobs in our area at this time. Our next major event is coming up in December. Happy birthday, Jesus celebration. Uh, we're expecting almost 3,000 children from over 26 villages to be on our campus. Um, for the last few years, uh, Forestdale has helped us uh, packing some bags and sending them with us. Um, and uh, he says it's great to connect. He's introducing himself to, uh, to, to Pastor Ethan and just continuing that relationship. So uh, I don't think we've formally reached out to him. A lot of times when he's here in the States, we do try to uh, nab him for a day or two to, to swing by this way. So uh, we'll, we'll reach out to him and see if we can, we can do that yet again. But uh, either way, we just want you to be aware of what's happening with Pastor Victor and uh, keep him in our prayers. Let's, uh, let's just look to the Lord together in prayer now. Uh, Lord God, we uh, just want to come before you, and, and uh, we thank you that we could spend that time uh, here together this evening just singing your promises, that you are the faithful God. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You hide your children in the shelter of your wings. You're protective of us. You're actually, your word tells us, even jealous of our affections. You desire that our affections would be wholly and completely on you and father we we just confess that that's a battle we wish that were true more often than it actually is but lord we ask that there would be a reorienting work by your holy spirit here this evening as we gather in the name of jesus that you would orient our hearts and our worship and our lives our sufficiency our confidence our peace that those would all be redirected back to Jesus and what he's done for us on that cross. Thank you for this time of worship and of praise. And Father, thank you that as this group of people gathers here at 110 Route 130, these prayers that we offer up burst out of these walls. They reach the very throne of heaven and they circle the earth. And so as we see things going on uh, in the world today. Uh, we think of the nation of Taiwan and the fear that must be gripping a lot of hearts in that part of the world as uh, China uh, rattles its sabers and, 
and, and induces that, that fear, Lord. We just pray for that nation. We pray for those people. We pray, Lord, that you would bring peace to that region. We pray the same, Lord, for Ukraine. And as people there are continuing to live one day to the next, not knowing uh, what to expect, Father, we pray for your peace to reign in that place. Father, humble the hearts of the proud and the wicked. Bring them down, Lord. And, and uh, we know ultimately in the end you will do that. But we ask, Lord, that as Jesus taught us to pray, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we know uh, part of your will, part of your plan is to, uh, is to bring about peace. And uh, Lord, we think of the families and the, the children that are, that are suffering and struggling. Lord, we, we, we pray for them. We ask for their protection and that you would be Jehovah Jireh to them, that you would provide. Provide the food and the medical aid, Lord, that's needed there. Father, in this broken world, there's just too many places to, to name, but we do want to lift up the nation of Belize and, and particularly the, the, the work of, of uh, Pastor Victor and, and Sharon, Lord. Um, we pray for them. Thank you that they are an extension of what we do here and, um, and that we don't even have to be in regular contact with them to recognize that the arm of Forestdale Church, our physical arms are short, but our spiritual arms are are without measure because in the kingdom of Christ we are part of work that's going on all around the world. Thank you that we get to partner with Pastor Victor and the things that are going on in Belize. We pray, Lord, for um, th these kids that receive back-to-school backpacks. We thank you for the witness that I know uh, both Victor and Cher and are faithful to share. And Father, may their light shine bright in that part of the world. Father, may you provide for them May you be their provision and their strength. Father, would you bless them and multiply uh, uh, their efforts on behalf of your kingdom. Father, we pray against the powers of darkness that reign and, and the witchcraft and the, 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 the sorcery that takes place in, in regions of the world like that. Father, help uh, Pastor Victor to, to have spiritual wisdom and strength to do the work that you've called he and his wife to do. Father, for each one of us, Pray for the mission that you've given us as, uh, as we leave this church every, every Sunday evening, as we walk underneath that sign that says you're now entering the mission field. Father, may that truly be our, our heartbeat to recognize that this is, this is the huddle. This is where we get our game plans. This is where we download from your Holy Spirit the things we need to do and say for the week ahead. But when we walk out these doors, that's when we put it into practice. That's where the enemy gets riled. That's where victories are won. That's where we demonstrate that we are more than conquerors in Christ. So, Father, I pray for the mission of this church and the missionaries that are sitting right here. Father, embolden us. Give us the courage. Give us the faith to be the people you've called us to be and to bear the witness, Lord, that you've called us to bear. Thank you for Forestdale Church and your provision. We do pray, Lord, that you would continue to provide uh, for the needs that we have as a church. Lord, everything that we have comes from you. And, uh, Lord, this, this is your church, and we are merely stewards for a time. Find us, Lord, we pray that you would find us faithful for the time that we've stewarded this work. We've been faithful to pray. We've been faithful to give. We've been faithful to serve. Thank you for this time, Lord, this time of worship, this time in your presence, Lord. We just ask that you would um, be with Ethan as he shares the message. Give him the words to say, Lord. Pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would speak through him. So we pray all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Back on. Thank you. The scripture reading for this week is found in Ruth chapter 1. Um, Verses 1 through 5. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab to live there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. 
They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Thank you, Bruce. Well, excited to be back in the pulpit and um, excited to be in a new series, Ruth. We're going to be going through Ruth uh, verse by verse for the next six weeks. R- really uh, exciting book because God shows up in the places you least expect him to when you're reading Ruth, and, and we'll kind of get a little overview of that this evening. But these first five verses of Ruth serve as a prologue to the rest of the book. They set us up to see particular despair so that we will see all the more of the Lord's magnificent provision in the end. Um, scripture up to this point, if you read chronologically, um, God's people are always traveling place to place. The narrators use geography as symbols to show different themes of remembrance. But Ruth is unique, this book, because everything happens in Bethlehem. As we read in verse 1, a man from Bethlehem went to Moab, but we'll find that the narrative does not get picked up until Naomi comes back to Bethlehem. So what then is the purpose of this prologue, these first five verses? If the story doesn't pick up until Naomi settles in Bethlehem, why these quick details about Elimelech traveling to Moab? It's to show us that nothing good happens when we leave the place that God has promised to work. Nothing good happens when we leave the place that God has called us to be. We will find nothing helpful anywhere else apart from the Lord. Have you had this experience? Maybe you thought the grass was greener on the other side, and so you packed everything up to go there, only to find that once you get settled, actually, it's not so green as you thought, and maybe you regretted leaving at all. Perhaps it was a change in your job. You moved. You changed your education plan. Maybe you were left You left the relationship for another, or you changed where you went to church, or perhaps you changed that you went to church at all. What happened to Elimelech is nothing new. It's a phenomenon of life that continues to be experienced by people today, and it is experienced in many other ways. So so let's look a little bit more at what happened in Elimelech's life so that we can learn how God works, so that we can respond rightly to our God and experience the joy and the peace that are only found where He is. The book begins with this phrase, in the days when the judges ruled. Now, this is a reference to the book of Judges that comes right before in our English Bibles, the book of Ruth. It was a time in Israel's history of incredible dysfunction, constant back and forth between bondage and liberation. It was littered with um, oppression from other nations. At times we see the nation of Israel joyously worshiping other gods besides the Lord. We see lots of warfare and bloodshed. There was essentially no certainty of life if you lived in Israel in the times of judges. They lived in constant extremes, either totally depending on the Lord or utterly forsaking the Lord. Verse 1 continues, and there was famine in the land. Now, in the Lord's covenant with the Israelites under Moses, he lists famine as a pending judgment he would send on his people if they were to forsake him for other gods. So in light of the covenant that they're under, it's not a stretch to see the famine mentioned here in Ruth as judgment from God, especially in light of the fact that this is happening in the time of the judges. Need I remind you, the book of Judges ends with this sobering verse. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Well, next, 
the narrator gives more detail than necessary. He could have just said, and Elimelech left Judah for Moab, one nation for another nation. But instead, he gives us the name of the town, the little town. Why? Bethlehem means house of bread. That's, the, that's Beth is house, Lehem, bread, house of bread. This amplifies the despair that has fallen on Elimelech. He left the house of bread because it didn't have so much as crumbs to give her people. Now, Elimelech was just an example of the foolish regret and dysfunction that we see happening all through the Israelites um, time and again in the book of Judges as they forsake and forget the Lord. Perhaps Elimelech intended to bring his family back. I don't want to be too hard on him. I don't know his intentions. But he dies in Moab. The narrator makes this seem abrupt and doesn't continue saying anything more about him. At any rate, Elimelech's sons bring the folly of their father to a new level. They marry foreign wives, which, again, under the covenant that they're under, that is prohibited, strictly prohibited, and is seen itself as a sign of judgment. Well, not only was famine seen as judgment, but barrenness was a curse. Elimelech's sons were married for 10 years and died, never able to have children. I'm, I'm sure they found food in Moab after all. They lived 10 years, but they couldn't keep their life. This all leaves Naomi as good as her dead husband and sons without anyone to provide for her and no one to protect her. Now, the problem was not that Elimelech left a place of famine in order to find some food. That wasn't the problem. It was deeper than that. He had forsaken the Lord's promised means to work. In the same passage of Deuteronomy that says that famine would be judgment on his people, the Lord says the solution, repent, and I will provide. I will deliver you if you repent. Yet Elimelech did what was right in his own eyes, leaving the land the Lord promised to bless his people and settling in a foreign nation that had foreign gods. Nothing good happens when we forsake the place that the Lord has promised to work. Nothing good happens when we forsake the place that the Lord has called us to be. Well, how will Naomi get out of this predicament? That's what we're going to see the next few weeks. How will the Lord provide? You know what a good story is all about uh, when you compare the beginning of the story with the ending of the story. How is the, how is the, the author setting us up to see resolution in the end? So I'm going to spoil a couple things for you about Ruth, okay? First, when her sons died, Naomi was left without any children. The author uses that intentional word, children. But fast forward to the end of the book. Ruth, her daughter-in-law, has a son. But the author says, Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him, and the women living there says, Naomi has had a son. But there's a second and closely related theme in the book of Ruth. The point isn't merely that Naomi doesn't have a son. The point is more about Israel receiving a king. As one commentator writes, the story opens with Elimelech, whose name means my God is king. And it ends with a genealogy that climaxes in King David. David is the answer to this pivotal problem we see in Judges that Israel had no king. So the issue, issue of barrenness was not merely an issue of missing out on the joy of having children. This certainly was difficult for Naomi, but the issue was regarding God's promise to his, to his people to raise up deliverers for them and to give them a Messiah king who would come through being born among the Israelites. So we're set up to ask, will God's purposes stand true? How will God turn things around? You and I wonder these same things today all the time in our lives as Christians, we wonder these same things in our life as a church. 
Has God forgotten me? Has God forgotten us? I thought he had a plan for my life, but now I'm not so sure. If he does, how will he turn things around and when? As a church member, you might be thinking, and I've been asked this, Pastor Ethan, where are we going as a church? Well, we're finally coming out of COVID. A new pastor has come. Some people have left. Will new people come? If God has a plan for us, how will he turn things around? Uh, some of you have met my grandmother. She came to the installation service a few months back. She is a very gentle and kind spirit, but her convictions are firm. I'll never forget being a young child, my grandmother looking at me gravely and saying, I don't believe in luck. I thought, what's the big deal with believing in luck? Does she think it's superstitious or something? But she explained, I don't believe in luck because I believe in the providence of God. That was a new word for me. The providence of God is something we believe in Forest Dale Church. You can read it on what we believe on our website. We believe in God's work of creation, providence, and redemption. So what is the providence of God? Well, I, I, I like this one the best. A Reformed Dutch catechism from the 16th century explains it beautifully. So that this is the Heidelberg Catechism. Ask, ask, these old, uh, ask these little Dutch children this question, and they'll tell you. What do you understand by the providence of God? They'll say, a uh, providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God by which he upholds, as with his hand, heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health, sickness, prosperity and poverty all things in fact come to us not by chance but from his fatherly hand isn't that good news providence is often contrasted with miracle having miracle referring to god's work through supernatural means and providence referring to god's work through natural or ordinary means we'll see this throughout the book of ruth here's my definition his providence, God's sovereign power to accomplish his perfect plan through the circumstances of ordinary life. The providence of God teaches us what the Apostle James says, that every good and perfect gift comes from above. Pastor John Piper wrote a massive book that I've been reading for months, maybe a year now, halfway through, called Providence. He needs 700 pages to just to, just to show us all the providence of God throughout Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Here's some examples of Scripture. Job said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Jesus said in Matthew 5, the Father causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good, and He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. He's talking about ordinary things like a rising sun or falling rain. Ultimately, as from God's own fatherly hand. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 8, 28, I probably say this verse every other week, God works all things together for the good of those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. Even in the death of Jesus, we see the providence of God at work. Although God sent Jesus by a miracle, being born of a virgin, he saved us by the work of providence an ordinary death on a cross by crucifixion under Roman guards. Over and above and in and through the ordinary circumstances of life, there is a sovereign God working out all of these things to accomplish his perfect plan for the glory of his name and the good of his people. Here's a couple examples that we'll see in Ruth. From, for our passage next week next sunday verse six when naomi heard when she was in moab she heard that the lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them 
So we might think, well, the Lord's providing food for them. Maybe he's sending manna from heaven. Maybe an angel has appeared. Maybe a prophet has come out of the wilderness to speak when it comes to the work of God. We often, our knee-jerk reaction is to think of miracle, but what does the author say here? So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. The providence of God, working through something as ordinary as the seasons of the year, we can easily anticipate God's work in the miraculous, only to foolishly overlook God's work in the ordinary. Here's just one more example. Ruth chapter 2, Ruth went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, the author writes, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech, as it turned out. The author here is being modest, setting us up to see the providence of God at work in the unassuming, ordinary, everyday things of life. In a world where a sovereign God reigns over all, there is no such thing as luck. And because the Lord is sovereign over everything, everywhere, we can trust him right where we are. If you're looking for the main takeaway, that's it. Because the Lord is sovereign everywhere, we can trust him right where we are. So let's close by asking, what does it mean for us to trust the Lord right where we are? Well, if you're not a, a Christian, we're happy you're here. Uh, we don't check IDs at the door. We're happy you're here. You're always welcome. What does it mean for you to trust the Lord right where you are? Well, you're like a Limelech, wandering from place to place, searching for the bread of life, trying to find something to satisfy the hunger of your soul, but you need to stop and trust the Lord right where you are. What does it mean for you to do that? It means for you to come to Jesus just as you are. Stop looking for other things, other people, hobbies, commitments to be something that will give you ultimate satisfaction and rest they never can they never will come to jesus the living water and bread of life and come to jesus just as you are yes i'm not gonna keep any secrets from from you jesus will radically change your life if you come to him but in order to come to jesus and receive him as he is you have to come to him just as you are Here's why. Because we need Jesus for all that he is. We can't bring any of us with, with us. And we can trust the Lord right where we are because the Lord sent Jesus to receive us just as we are. We read in Romans 5, God demonstrates his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 10, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. So Jesus says in Matthew 11, come to me, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden. I think that's a King James version. It's just in my head, sorry. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls if you come to me. It is a grave mistake to wait to come to Jesus until you clean yourself up first. Why? Because all our righteousness, all our cleanness must be found in Jesus. Therefore, don't try to acquire righteousness, whatever you do, first, before coming to Jesus. And all our rest must be found in him. So don't try to find rest in yourself or anything else. First, before you come to Jesus, you and I can find neither righteousness nor rest in anywhere else outside of Jesus, as, if we're honest, our whole lives have already proved 
time and again. I love how one pastor put it, Dane Ortland. He says that when we invite you, neighbor, friend, non-Christian person, when we invite you to life together in the church, what people often hear us saying, and by the way, if you're a believer and you're inviting someone to church, no, this is what they're hearing you say. People often hear us saying, Dane Ortland says, would you like to come and do religion with me? Would you like to come with me and stop being bad and start being good? But actually, what we're inviting you into and what the gospel declares is an invitation to trade in all our good and our bad to be free. Thank you, Dane Ortland, for that insight. So, would you trade in all your good and all your bad to be free? Come to Jesus just as you are. Trust the Lord right where you are. Receive and rest in Christ alone for salvation. Now, for those of you who have received and are resting in Christ alone for salvation, if you're a Christian, is there a relationship you want out of? Is there a job you no longer want? Is there another place or circumstance of life that you would rather be in? Like, I can't tell you from Ruth chapters 1, verses 1 through 5, whether or not you should stay or go. God's word doesn't work like that. But at least while you wait, would you trust the Lord right where you are? Would you acknowledge God as the Lord of all creation, who upholds all things by his sovereign providence? Would you acknowledge that? And would you believe again that he knows where you are? He knows your circumstance, and he's committed himself to you by his covenant with Christ to provide you everything you need to be faithful in your calling right where you are. I'm not saying whether you should stay or go. I'm just saying you can trust the Lord right where you are. Recently, Catherine and I had friends stay with us for a few days. Their youngest son was perhaps four years old, and his mother, Cassie, was complaining to us about certain kids' movies. She said, they sing songs about following your heart, and I have to tell my son, no, don't follow your heart. It's desperately wicked. Now, that's not her opinion. She's just quoting the prophet Jeremiah follow your heart? Let's let's be real. As if you've never let yourself down. No, follow God's word, which tells you exactly where you should be in his presence together with his people. The apostle Paul outlines this in Ephesians chapter 2. The first half he's telling us how we've uh, become a Christian. We've been made alive by the Holy Spirit And in the end of chapter 2, how the Spirit of God has united us together with his people, Christ's body, the church, where it is that we fulfill our calling in Christ Jesus to do the good works God has prepared in advance for us to do, Ephesians 2, verse 10. He writes, the result of our redemption is this, verse 19, that we are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And in Christ, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you two are being built together as a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. So we can at least rule out one thing. In the Christian faith, isolation is never a legitimate option. It goes against our calling as Christians, and also it goes against the work of redemption that the Spirit has brought in our life. When times are tough, it's tempting to drift away, but hang on and trust the Lord right where you are in his presence with his people. Finally, as a church, as a church, what does it mean for us to trust the Lord right where we are 
in the 90s. That was my day. Uh, Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago, pastored by Bill Hybels. It was one of the fastest growing churches in America. They turned church methods on its head and revolutionized their influence like never before. And after 10 years of expansive growth, growth, Pastor Bill Hybels and a team of researchers started a three-year study to track the spiritual growth they've experienced and to measure it. The result, though, startled them and cause them to reverse course and to go back to the basics they had forsaken. They published their study. I have it in my office. And one of the main assumptions that they said that they were operating under during that time was this. Have you ever thought this before? That the more energy a Christian put into the activities of the church, the more they would grow in their love for God. It sounds okay. But their research showed, quote, an increasing level of activities did not predict an increasing love for God. Rather, they discovered that an increasing love for God is determined by one's relationship with Jesus. Pastor Bill Hybels concluded, quote, This study has caused me to see clearly that the church and its myriad of programs have taken on too much of the responsibility for people's spiritual growth. Now, with all the outward measures of success that would excite and encourage any one of us, they changed their minds, realizing they had it all wrong. One pastor put it this way, we're called to make disciples. Discipleship culture, though, is not volunteer culture. And that's what he learned at his church, too, in Australia. Well, as a church, so then what does it mean for us to trust the Lord right where we are? It means for us to continue to rely on the, the means that God has promised to work in, never to abandon it for methods, regardless of the mirage of growth that they display. So where then has God promised to work? Well, the Lord walks his people through this conversation in Isaiah chapter 55, he says, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Why are you doing these things that leave you empty? Who cares if they look impressive and draw large crowds if the result is you are left no more mature in your love for the Lord? Verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. He's saying, come to me. I have the solution for you. But he continues, keep this in mind, folks. Verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways aren't your ways. In other words, you'll be tempted to doubt what I'm about to say. Because sometimes it's not going to appear to be working very well. Verse 10, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return um, it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. Here it is, verse 11. So is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The solution the Lord proposes to restore his people is his word, the proclamation of his word. And what is the result of this work? Verse 12, you will go out in joy and be led forth, forth with peace. And you know about these um, clapping trees, right? Verse 13. The Apostle Paul called this the foolishness of preaching. As a church, we can leave the means that God has promised to use for places that God never promised to show up. We will always be tempted to leave greener, uh, for greener pastures Elsewhere, Christians change churches, churches change methods. But where has God promised to work? Through his word. As it is through his Christ-exalting, spirit-inspired word that he has promised both to create faith and to strengthen faith. After all, it is that through hearing, 
Faith comes. Faith comes through hearing. Through the word, the message about Christ, Romans 10, 17. Elimelech left for Bethlehem, left Bethlehem for Moab. But sure enough, in time, word came to Naomi that the Lord was providing for his people in the very place they had just left. And it's only when she returns, we'll begin next week, that she can then finally participate in what the Lord is doing. May we never forsake a wholehearted dependence and reliance on the Word of God to do the work of God, as He's promised it would, even in times of famine. What was once a house of bread where many would come to eat may appear to be a house of crumbs sometimes. But may we trust the Lord right where we are, relying on the work of the Spirit through His Word to nourish the faith of His people. Well, let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the endless treasures that we find when we dig. I pray that you would continue to show us Christ through your word. And may your word do its work by the Spirit in our hearts to change us, to be the types of people who rely on you and respond to you as you've called us to, with gratitude and praise. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
means for evil, you turn it for our good. You turn it for our good, for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our 